Welcome to the Insurance Brokers Podcast Helpful Hints. Here we break down the best, most informative bits of our full-length interviews. Good morning, Andy. Thank you so much for joining me today on Coffee Calm and Connections Podcast. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, Me too. Thanks for asking me. I've never been quite sure how I get invited to these things, but I'm delighted that I'm here. Well, I think we're going to have a really fun conversation if our last conversation is anything to go by. So do you want to start by just telling us who is Andy Cope and what is the art of brilliance? Yeah, yeah. We, we just, just for the listeners, we did have a little conversation off screen, didn't we, before? And it was, uh, I, you're one of those people I think I feel like I've known forever and we've only like met for five minutes, which is great. I think this conversation could it go is. on for hours and we've got about <laughs> half an hour. So so I'm Andy. I'm a um, uh, doc, doctor of happiness, which I know that I just needs to land with the listeners a little bit. So well, basically, I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but I'm, if you think of all the doctors you've ever met, I'm the opposite of that. So the rest of the psychological and, and medical profession looks at what's wrong with people with a view to fixing them and putting them right. Whereas I spent 12 years at Loughborough Uni doing a PhD in positive psychology, which is essentially looking at what's right with people. So all of us, we can all think of a handful of people in our life who've got something extra, so whether it's extra energy, extra positivity, the kind of slightly weird, happy people who like, they seem to like Mondays the same as they like Fridays. And it's these, and these in the workplace, these are the ones who go the extra mile who the heck are they? So what I decided to do at Loughborough was seek out, well, psychology has ignored those people for 150 years on the grounds of them not being ill. I thought, well, you know, I'm quite interested in them on three levels. Right? First of all, who the heck are the happy people? Secondly, what are they doing that allows them to flourish? And thirdly, most importantly, in terms of maybe what we want to do today is what could we then learn from them <laughs> or some ideas we could steal off them that we could apply to our own lives so we might have a chance of having a spring in our step as well. So that's what I've been doing for 20 years. 12 of those who spent at Loughborough Uni. Hence, I get to call myself a Doctor of Happiness. Which is the best title I think there possibly is in the world. And I have a question for you. How did you go about finding people that are happy? Because that's surely a subjective viewpoint. It, yes, it is. Well, I mean, most academics will call it, in fact, they'll call it subjective well-being rather than happiness. Happiness is a bit... A bit twee and a bit sort of uh, proper academic. I'm not a proper academic, right? I'm a, I'm a sort of children's author turned academic. I ground out my PhD after 12 years. I just think sometimes Loughborough just gave it me to leave. You know, you've been there so long. Hand your library card in, here's your PhD, leave the, leave the premises. But I think um, that it's not an exact science. It's a very inexact science. And well-being is a very subjective thing. So what I basically, I mean, it's a bit of a technical thing, but what I did was, I spent, the reason I spent 12 years is I got the wrong data. So I spent two years getting the, asking the wrong people. So what I would do is go to a business and do a survey. How, are you, how, how happy are you on a scale of one to 10? And if you, eight or above, that's abnormally happy. So what I would do is speak to those people. And then what I found was, that a lot of those people who were, I'd go and interview them, a lot of those people who were like a 10 out of 10 were just weird. They were just like a bit scary. They were, and they weren't happy as in, they were like over the top with it. And like, these people are not happy. They're just a little bit odd. So I, so I binned it. I started again. So same question. So I started again from scratch. Same question was, on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you? If you rate 8 or above, I'm interested. Second thing you had to do, For all the eight or aboves, I gave them what's called the Oxford Happiness Questionnaire, which is a tried and tested academic thing, 39 questions. If you also scored in the upper quartile of that, then I'm doubly interested. But the third thing to be one of my people I'm interested in is you score high on, on, so eight or above, you also score in the upper quartile of the Oxford Happiness. But also there's a question on my PhD, which was who else in your workplace makes you feel great? And if your name appears three times or more on that list then I'm really interested because you've scored yourself happy. Oxford Happiness Questionnaire says you're happy and other people are, you're making them feel good as well. And it's that final question that sorted out the weirdos and it got out rid of all the ridiculously, there's an old English word, grinagog, right? A grinagog is 17th century English word. A grinagog is somebody who's so happy you want to punch their lights out. So it, it sorted, I didn't want, I'm not interested in those because they're like fake jazz handsy people. I'm interested in those who are creating what I call flourishing, which is an uplift in emotions in the people around them. So who else in your workplace makes you feel good? They're the people I was interviewing. Sorry, it was a a short question, long answer. Uh, It's a fabulous answer. And Grinagog is my new favourite word. And a slight uh, side anecdote. Uh, If I'd had that word last night, it would have been fabulous because we had my daughter's um, parents' evening and uh, she got one 
one tiny negative comment and she came out of the evening sobbing. I hate that teacher. She's so happy. I want to punch her in the face and it's all fake. <laughs> so had I had the word Grinagog to hand... I would have now, you know, brought it's a joy to word, her. Isn't it? it is a beautiful <laughs> word. But we all know there are. you can fake happiness and you can be too happy. It's another thing I looked at. I didn't look at it in any great depth. And I'm, my, I'm not, I deliver training and write books and I'm not asking anybody to be too happy. If you're scaring people with your happiness or they're wanting to do, punch your lights out, that's not right. That's not what I'm after. I call them two percenters. So when you plot them on a graph of well-being, it's the people at the top of that graph who are statistically significantly happier on a long-term basis. Plus, the killer for me is they've got statistically significantly more energy. So happiness and energy kind of come together. So my, my, the people that I interviewed, they've got about 40% more energy than a normal person. And I'm like, wow, I could do with a bit of that myself in the modern world. So they're, they're the ones, and, and like I say, for 150 years, traditional psychology has ignored those people because they're functioning perfectly okay. You know, they're, they're, what we've got is all these ill people over here, so let's, let's focus all the resources on trying to get, and I'm not saying this is wrong, by the way, trying to, to get depressed people less depressed. Here's some medication, some counselling, some therapy. But my take on it, and it's a bit controversial, Sarah, right, and some people will hate this, is that what we're currently doing with mental health isn't working. Right, because over 150 years of the best re- best psychology and the best medication and the best therapy and the best counselling we can do in that time period, mental ill health has absolutely got a whole lot worse, not a whole lot better. So, what I think there's something missing. So, looking at happy people and, and stealing some ideas off them sounds really obvious to me. Do you know what? I couldn't agree more. And again, this might be uh, controversial, but I was having a conversation with a teacher not that long ago and she was telling me that post covid they'd all delivered a uh, trauma count they'd all had an hours training on how to be a trauma counselor that they'd then been able to deliver to the children and and she taught me through some of that and i said something i think that's missing from what you're telling me is is ownership so and i don't think you can have empathy without ownership because that promotes victimization and external things to change so yes I know you're having a hard time sit here and 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 just you know relax and you'll be okay eventually versus yes I know you're having a hard time what can we do together to put it right and I think that's another area that perhaps is missing in in modern society it's a preventative positive psychology is a preventative thing what we're currently doing um I know this isn't necessarily about kids and schools but what we're doing is is we're waiting for people to break and then we're fixing them, all right? Whereas, whereas what positive psychology does, it gives you some strategies and some know-how and some tools and techniques that when the world does its worst, which it bloody well will in your life, the world is going to batter us all. What happens is that we might bend, but we don't have to break. If we knew how to be more resilient and we knew how to be mindful and, and, and grateful, and it's all obvious stuff, by the way. There's nothing difficult in any of this. It's a reminder of how to be at our best self. There's, a, there's another, here's another word for you. It's a, a very simple word from Finland. Uh, it's one of my favorite words. It's sisu. Sisu, S-I-S-U. S-I-S-U. And sisu is, uh, it hasn't quite got a direct English translation. It's sort of, you, you know when you've got something to get through in life and you're not sure you can get through it, it's massive, it's a big thing, and you're already exhausted. You're depleted and you're like, oh my gosh, no way. But you somehow dig deep and you find your reserve tank and you get whatever it was, you manage to pull through it six months later and you're like, oh my gosh, I've done it. Sisu is that reserve tank. It's a backbone. It's, a, it's a, the ability to actually stare a challenge in the face and put your middle finger up at it and go, do you know what? I'm going to get through this. And I think that when we've been in a pandemic for 18 months, I don't know when people listen to this, but we're at the back end of a back end, he says, of a pandemic, he hopes, is that I think there's a lot of people running on empty. And I think there's a lot of people that have been running on empty for a very long time. And therefore, this Sisu, this finding that reserve tank to get through these final few months of a pandemic, I think is really, really crucial, actually. And again, that's what positive psychology does. It gives you stuff that keeps you going rather than letting you break and then fix you, which the rest of psychology does. I'm not arguing that's a bad thing, by the way. Mm. What I'm arguing is that the stats are going the wrong way. So doing more medication and doing more therapy and going into schools and teaching kids about trauma, I think maybe setting them up to spot trauma and be traumatized again that's a bit controversial but i can see it happening in schools i had a, a one i'm doing a course at the moment around about well-being and positive psychology and one of the the sort of pivotal things that i thought was interesting is if your goal is running away from something uh you will always go back to it 
if your goal is running towards something, that's when you'll get there. I just like that idea. It won't fit for everything, but I like the analogy. And I have noticed in my own vocabulary that I am trying to change everything to be running towards rather than running away. Yeah, that's good NLP stuff, the towards goals rather than the away from. Um, I, I do think so. And I, I, I just, do you know what? I've had a school, uh, again, we're twisting this to schools really, but I've had a conversation, I better not even say where it is, but in the north of England where... And it's a sixth form college. And the head teachers rang me up and said, right, there's only 50% of teenagers rocking up to our lessons. We've got a fantastic curriculum and gr- it's a brilliant school and only 50% are turning up. And, and they're ringing up and going, I can't come to school because I've got anxiety. I can't come to school. The exact phrase they said was, I've got my mental health. Right? And the teachers go, well, I'm not sure what that means. But this is them being backed up by the parents who are saying, oh, we're too anxious to go to school. And the parents are always oh, too anxious, you stay off school. And these kids are now... Um, missing out on an education, honestly. And, and I'm telling you, when you leave school and you enter the real world of work, then you're not pre- going to be prepared for that because work isn't going to let you, you know, you know, it's, it's, oh my gosh, it's worrying me, actually. I'm a doctor of happiness and it's stressing me out a bit because I think we are becoming a, well, I don't know, it's, we'd, maybe we've just forgotten how to be resilient. I don't know. And I don't want to be too controversial with it. But I'm I think very... we might be talking ourselves into a medical uh, issues that, that probably aren't all that real. And it's doing a disservice to the people who genuinely have got mental health issues. I couldn't agree more. And that's, I suppose, what I meant, meant about the, the having empathy versus having ownership. If you are um, if you are supporting somebody who is highly anxious, highly depressed, uh, clinically depressed, um, you know, my, a psychologist that I've done some work with calls it the working well. If you're supporting somebody, enable don't allow, don't give this, this idea. And one, one thing that horrified me, there was a little girl uh, in my daughter's year uh, last year uh, who said to my daughter, uh, no, said to another friend, can you change the date of your sleepover because I don't really want her to come, my daughter. My daughter uh, called her up on it and said that really wasn't very nice. And her response was, my anxiety made me do it. And I thought, oh, my world, like this is not okay. And how do we give how do we give our young people this the the resilience? So on that note, talk to me about what you found with positive people and what we could do. Happy people. It is the age of anxiety. That's why I keep I keep quoting that. It really is. Um, Now. Um, by the way, I don't think most people, the vast majority of people, I mean, no mental health is a genuine issue, by the way, and I know that people are genuinely struggling. So I, I get that, but my stuff isn't about that, right? My stuff is about people who are what I call languishing. And languishing isn't a clinical disorder, and you don't need pills for it. It's a sense of something's missing. It's a sense of meh. It's that kind of, oh. you get out of bed on Monday morning, is this it? I thought my life was going to be epic, and it's actually a bit dull. That's languishing, right? And what it is is a million miles from feeling as great as you could. So if you plot the people on the graph, the, there's a lot of people languishing. There's something that I call, I call irritable bastard syndrome, right? Which is, I think is when we just kind of get subsumed into this general malaise of negativity. And it's super easy. What human beings are is we're, we're gregarious. We're pack animals. So what we've got is this inbuilt desire. It's a human need to fit in. So 10,000 years ago on the African savannah, a lone human was a dead human. So we've got to be part of a team, a tribe, a clan, a community, a family. If we can't belong, then we're, we're isolated and that does us damage as well. So therefore this need to belong is baked into our psyche. So what we do is we look around at what everybody else is doing and we copy them, we do that, right? So nobody else likes Monday, so Mondays must be a bit rubbish, so I'll think Mondays are rubbish as well. Everybody else is moaning about the, the, uh, the weather and the late trains and the buses and the politicians. So what I, the most, it feels like the most natural thing in the world is to just do that. And what I'm looking at is my, my two percenters, my ones at the top of the wellbeing chart, they t- generally look around at what the rest of the world is doing and don't do that. Is They're not joining in with those conversations. They are taking charge of their own well-being and they provide an uplift for the people around them which is the crucial thing that's that flourishing that, that, that i was looking at is is your happen here's one for you listeners right when you're feeling amazing genuinely amazing not grinagog amazing <laughs> is then your your happiness will leak out of you and reach three degrees of people removed from you so there's a ripple effect right this is the research of nick Christakis. so 
if you're feeling great in the morning, right, and your kids come down for breakfast, your kids will be happier, right, because you're serving the toast with a smile. Kids will then go to school because they're happier. Their teacher will be happy and their schoolmates will be happier. But it doesn't even stop there. Then when that teacher goes home to the teacher's family at the end of the day because the teacher's happier, the teacher's family's happier, right? And you started that in the morning in the kitchen by serving the toast with a smile on your face. So I love the idea that it's, your happiness is bigger than you. And if we understood that, of course, happiness is good for you personally. But if it's also good for your friends, your friends, friends, and your friends, 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 then it's a really, really quite a serious issue. Now, in terms of what they, what, what happy people do is the plot spoiler alert is they live in exactly the same external world as everybody else. So uh, happy people are in a pandemic as well. It rains on happy people. Their bus is late as well. So it, this is about the in, what I call intentional strategies. So the happiness exists in your head. That's where the, the difference is, is how they process the world around them. It isn't the world, <laughs> right? The world isn't doing anything to you until you give it some thought. And it's the thinking that's creating the emotions. So what two percenters have and what I look specifically at is what I call intentional strategies. Strategies in your head that you can, and you can learn them. That's the other thing. So if you were teaching this in schools, kids could pick up these strategies. One of the um, uh, anecdotes that I took from Mo Gaudat's uh, Soul for Happy book, uh, exactly to this point, he, he was a, or he loves cars and had a, I don't know, posh car, I know nothing about cars, so had a, a, an expensive car that his wife wrote off. There are two things, the two ways of looking at that. My best beloved car's been written off, this is the worst day. My wife survived it without a scratch. This is the best day. And that, for me, was quite a powerful analogy in terms of the outlook, the sort of the lens through which you view the world. It, it's the same situation, Sarah. That's it. It's the same situation, just viewed differently. We would call it uh, explanatory style. People have got a different explanatory style. And um, you're, you're, basically what, what we are is we're all one big story. We, we are a story that we tell ourselves. Who we are isn't real. It's just what we accumulation of stories that we've told ourselves, and I think, and therefore, that, I think that's really interesting because I think it's never too late to have a good childhood. Even at age fifty-four, I can let some bullying age seven ruin my life at age fifty-four. If I think about it now at age fifty-four, I can still feel, you know, um, insecure about that, or I can change the story. And I can change the narrative. And once I change the story, which again is in my head, it's not an external thing. And I come out, do you know what? I survived that bully. And I've grown. We, we always hear about post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So stuff that's happened in the past that's destroyed you now in this future. We never hear about the opposite, which is post-traumatic growth. So it's people who come back from, from war zones actually stronger. The bad sometimes they actually create scars in us, but that actually makes us more resilient. So it's stuff like that. I mean, yeah, sorry, go. I have two questions on that. Number one, and they're completely different questions, and I know I'm going to forget both. So what I'm going to do here is pass both to you and make it your <laughs> thing you. to remember both and answer one after the other. So the first one is, how much is the media and social media to blame for this? Because um, it's, it's clickbaity, isn't it? It's the, the negative stories, the ones we go to, because naturally as humans we have a negative bias. Yeah. So that's one question. Second question is um, how do you change those stories? Because for some people, those stories are so ingrained, they are subconsciously ingrained. Uh, and, and what strategies have you found that we could do that? And then I've got an anecdote of my own to follow on. Okay. So over to you. Well, I think, I think in terms of media and social media, I do think that if we go back to kids again, I think that growing up, there's always been a contact sport. So we've always had to contend with exams and relationships and fitting in and being picked last in netball and not being invited to parties, right? We've all had that always in our life. But if you then layer on social media and a pandemic and COP26 environment terror, then I think that actually kids and teenage, teenagers particularly have got a lot more to contend with maybe than I did when I was growing up with the world was very simple. So, and of course, what social media does, again, particularly I think for girls, but boys also, is we, we compare ourselves to airbrushed perfection on Instagram. It's not even real. Right? We wonder why teenage girls are having panic attacks and feeling insecure when they're trying to live up to stuff that's just airbrushed. So I do think it gives us a false sense of, um, well, comparis comparisonitis, as I call it, is, uh, turns you green with envy. You want their life. 
You go on Facebook, everybody else says, their life's better than your life. You forget it's an edited highlights reel, that they're just putting the best bits of their life. And they actually have beans on toast for tea as well, like you. They didn't put a picture of that one. They put a picture of the Michelin star meal on instead. Anyway, whatever. So I do think that we what we need to do is make, uh, we're quite mindful that, and the news, the news is another thing, right? Age 54, when I was growing up, the news was on for 15 minutes a day, just before tea time and at 10 o'clock, 15 minutes. And then Magic Roundabout came on, so it can't have been that bad. And and there and now it's beamed live into your living room twenty four seven. So we are we are exposing ourselves to lots and lots of messages that I think can drag us down. So maybe just cut your social media by thirty or forty percent is maybe a top tip there straight away, which sounds absolutely. obvious. Absolutely, but also mo- I don't watch the news anymore, and my mum despairs because. In fact, when when uh, they were talking about coronavirus in January, February twenty two. I was like, what's, what's that? What's coronavirus? And she was like, bloody hell, Sarah, do you live in a cave? Like, that was her words to me. Like, I, I don't watch the news, but it's a deliberate thing on my part because every time I do, it's negative and I get worried and I, and I feel anxiety over things. And I, I don't need that in my life. There's enough stuff going on. So, no, taking that out. Well, that's, well can I pick you up on that? I think that's really important. I do think you need to watch a little bit of news, you know, to know whether there's a pandemic <laughs> and who we're at war with. But I rely on my me. mum to tell me. Yeah, 10 minutes a day. Um, but I think I, I read some research somewhere. Don't quote me on it. It might not be strictly true. It like if you stop reading the Daily Mail, you'll be seven percent happier straight away just by cutting that out of your life. So, and I and, and the news consumption is one of the things that I looked at with my two percenters, which means you are a two percenter because what they do is they they watch less news. They know it makes them feel bad, so they watch less of it. Whereas most people know it makes them feel bad, but watch it anyway and continue to watch it. And therefore, what you're doing is by restricting your news consumption a bit is you re- you're restricting the opportunity for bad stuff to you know, exposed to bad stuff. Um, so I think it's it's kind of beyond obvious, but you've you've taken an action, a very small action there that that helps you inoculate yourself against the modern world. So I mean, it's, it, uh, social media is the same thing. I, I've cut out social media on Fridays, uh, so no social and no, in fact, no tech. I've called it Techno Friday, and I've, I've re- honestly I can't tell you. I can't tell. I mean, the difference. I feel like I've got fourteen percent of my life back. So I'm not checking emails and I'm not doing social on Friday. And I feel like I have a long weekend. It's, like, it's amazing. And I'm, maybe I should just take it out of my life completely. But in the modern world, I don't think you can. I think you're trying to run a business and trying to create a brand. You've got to have a social media presence. But having a day clear of it, oh, my gosh, I feel amazing. Do you know, that's, that's a, another top tip right there because – I'm so all or nothing that I either remove everything from my phone and and I'm, you know, then genuinely lost or um, I'm all over it. But just one day that that is that's a that's a winner. Um, OK, so question for you uh, related to the last question um, of which I asked five all in one go. Uh, the question around resilience and what what are people doing before you answer? Can I? give you an anecdote because I'd like your opinion on it. So it was an epiphany that I had yesterday, literally yesterday while I was doing this course um, that I'm doing. I'm very logical. I'm very analytical. And sometimes I struggle to plug logic and emotion together. It's almost like they are constantly, they fight with each other. I know what I want to do and I know what I should do. And they're vaguely, very, very, uh, 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 never the same thing, right? And I had this idea, if I'm trying to be grateful, if I'm trying to be mindful, if if, if the the objective is uh, present or um, resilient, I can never do it because there is a logical mindset there to be mindful. I must meditate. Therefore, I will put this meditation on and I will sit here. Oh, my God, I'm not mindful. Oh, my God. So I am definitely failing. To be grateful, you find yourself being, what was it? Gringot. No, that's Harry Potter. Grinagog. Grinagog. Uh, you find being fake, basically. I'm really grateful when I looked out the window today and saw red trees. So it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. But something happened yesterday that I thought was really interesting. And I think we talked about it, uh, touched on it last time. If you lead with emotion and follow with logic positive emotion and follow with logic, you are naturally more grateful, more present, more mindful. And that, that for me, was quite a sort of pivotal 
<laughs> Epiphany. <laughs> a, yes, I spent about 12 years trying to find that out. And you basically know my research in, in one sort of anecdote there. Is the biggest single thing that my two presenters do is they consciously and deliberately choose to have a positive attitude. And I know if I deliver that at a conference, people are going, hang on, choose to be positive. Did we not know that 12 years ago? You know, were we paying him to tell us something bleeding obvious? But I don't think it is obvious. So I'm talking about deliberately and consciously choosing to be positive. Now, and a slightly nuanced academic point, it, I didn't, it's not choose to be happy, right? So you can't choose to be happy, despite what Instagram tells you in the memes, right? Happiness is an emotion that you can open up to and you can allow happiness in, but you can't choose it. But positivity isn't an emotion. It's an attitude. So it is something you can work on. And you're absolutely right. If you put that positivity first and you choose to be a positive version of yourself, you're opening yourself up to more good stuff. It's not a guarantee, but it massively improves the odds in your favor. And, and you begin to get some insights. And what happens is when you choose to be positive, because you can go into a situ any situation, you can be choose to be positive or not choose to be positive, but you will get it. So camping in the rain, right? Camping in the rain is your classic. So that's an external thing that's happening. You can sit in your tent moaning and groaning about how rubbish the holidays. Whose stupid idea was this? I told you this was a bad idea. This is an absolute nightmare. Or you can put your wellies on and go for a splash in all the puddles in the, on the campsite. It is exactly the same external situation, but a different choice about the positivity you bring to that situation. And therefore, cru crucially, you get a different result. Now, life is just a series of those situations, those set pieces they're all neutral until you apply yourself to them. And, and, the, and the version of you you decide to be, right? That's a really big deal. It's the version of you you decide to be. And we're back, that brings you back to the story about who you are. It absolutely does. I'm going to give you a real life example, which I think is this point, but I'm hoping this will resonate with a lot of people like me. So I am constantly on a diet. It's a yo-yo. has been a yo-yo since I was eight, right? I lose a bit of weight, put a bit of weight on, lose a bit of weight, really despise any form of food, have a panic attack when there's a dinner party, really like wine but feel bad every time I have a, a glass and therefore don't just have a glass, have a bottle. It's classic self-sabotage thing. So I was at my PT last yesterday, in fact. So I think this led to the epiphany. Uh, when I was doing the course, I was at the PT and I said to her, right, I've got a dinner party on Saturday. How am I going to manage this? And she said, that's a ridiculous question. And I said, oh, oh, why? She said, do you enjoy dinner parties? I said, yeah. She said, do you want to be able to go and enjoy a dinner party and, and, and wine? I said, yeah. She said, do you want any negativity in that? I said, no. She said, then don't go enjoy the dinner party. It'll be fine. And I thought to myself, what a ridiculous thing from my perspective, and she was absolutely right. Once I dropped all of that negative association, right, I'm only going to have three glasses of wine, and actually if I, if I portion control and I put it in my fitness pal, then actually it will be okay. All of that's negative. Stop it. Enjoy it. Lead with the enjoyment. I'm really excited about this, and I can almost guarantee that my natural inclination will be to stop after three or four glasses of wine because I haven't given myself that negative barrier to break through. I'm just going to enjoy it and see what happens. What's really pivotal? Can I give you my self-care thing? My, my epiphany recently is this, right? Because I, I love food. Oh, my gosh, I love food. And I love alcohol. And I love all the stuff that's naughty, right? And I struggled to try and... I've always got this... I, I'm always kind of really, really jealous of people who could just have one biscuit. I mean, what kind of bloody weirdos have... What, what's the point <laughs> of one biscuit? If the packet's open... It needs eating, right? And I am a good eater. So I'd regularly eat two or three packets of biscuits a week and then I'm getting fat and all that. And that, and so self-care, right? Self-care self for me was always looking after myself in this moment, in my head, being nice to myself, trying try my hardest to eat good food most of the time, right? And fail, a bit like you, ep epic fails, epic fails. About three packets of biscuits a week is not self-care, right? Then I realized, right? And I've been doing this 15 years. I didn't realize till last year, right? It's so obvious. True self-care is all the stuff I just talked about, being nice to myself now in this moment, while also, while also keeping an eye on the well-being of my future self. So now today's minute, today's me is looking out for the well-being of myself tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year. And therefore, Sarah, honestly, it's made everything a lot easier because now I can just have one biscuit because I know that three packets of biscuits every week isn't good for my diabetes in five years' time, so I'm not going to do it. And where it's always a chore to go out on a bike, mountain bike, because, oh, it's drizzling, I won't go because it's, I, it, I don't have to go. Now I don't care what, what the weather's doing. And I, what it's done for me, looking out for the well-being of my future self, has made all the, all the efforts gone. 
all, all the effort that to having to, it was a chore to have to eat the right stuff. stuff. It was a chore. And now it's just the most natural thing in the world, right? I can't, so if that lands with you, like it's landed with me, it's massive. It is massive. But my question to you, and again, I'm in this epiphany right now, the la just literally the last few days, putting self-care as a feeling rather than a should. That's a very powerful mindset. I should be doing this and I'm a bad person because I don't. I should be doing this and I'm a... The, the the word that for me has been a constant battle and it was only when I realized self-care self-love self-value is all part of the same thing do I value myself more than I value these three bottles of wine well yeah of course I do like <laughs> who doesn't and that that for me is the same kind of epiphany but it, it, it came to me, it came down to leading with how I feel over the logic process of what I should be doing. Love it. Love it. And uh, honestly, I, sometimes you can feel you want to go to the dinner party and have a few glasses of wine. That's perfectly fine. But your future self, to, the day after, your future self is going to be struggling. But that's fine if you've given yourself permission. As long as you don't do it all the time. Then my, big, my other big shift was the, the appreciation that you can't pour from an empty jug. So self-care was about... I can't give what I haven't got. So I can't actually give my family love and, and compassion and gratitude if I first haven't got those things myself. So the, and, and this is where self, I struggled with this for years, right? Therefore, self-care really, the best thing I will ever do for my family is look after me, which sounds so selfish. It sounds like the most selfish thing in the world, but it's the least selfish thing in the world because what my, what my family need is me buzzing with energy and vitality and on top form. And therefore, self-care becomes the most obvious thing in the world. And looking after myself today with an eye on the well-being of myself tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year has shifted. That's my epiphany. That shifted things hugely for me. Re recently, I've been 20 years of not understanding that. Even though I do this for a living, I didn't really, um, I wasn't looking out for my future self. And it's, it's the shift from here to here. I feel it now. I want it. And for me, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think we're very much on the same line. I think it's, I think it's really powerful. And, and I think something else that has, has, has sort of resonated is self-care isn't and shouldn't be easy because you are worth it. Therefore, work for it. Fantastic. And I would say, can I just pick up on one thing? You talked about, I'm going to try and be grateful. I'm going to try and do meditation. I'm going to try and eat healthy. If you lose the word try, I think that's a, that's a fabulous thing. Because as soon as you say, I'm going to try and be healthy and eat, and eat healthy food, your brain's going, no, you're not. You're lying, aren't you? <laughs> but if you say, I'm going to eat healthy food, you lose the word try, it becomes super powerful. And your brain's going, blimey, you meant that, didn't you? So, I, I mean, Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. He knew some shit, didn't he? So, yeah, copy Yoda. Lose the word try out of your vocabulary. Do you right. know what? That's the title of this podcast. Do or do not. There's no such thing as try. Brackets Yoda. There it is. Yoda. Let's, Andy, I'm I have really enjoyed this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I have as well. I have as well. And this has been a lot of fun. The, scratch the surface, Sarah. So if you, if you want more in a, a few months when, uh, I do. when we're out of the pandemic, it's a different set of top tips and a different conversation when we, when we come out. That yeah. would be fabulous. Let's definitely keep in touch because I, uh, I think uh, everything you do is incredible. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast this morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Your reviews, shares and followership is incredibly valuable to us. If you'd like to know more about our work through Coffee, Calm and Connection and how we can support you, please email us at hello at coffeecalmconnection.org or follow us on social media. Thank you.